Hello there, my name is Dr William Bird, and it's a real pleasure to address you all at this exciting time of the beginning of RISE. Um, and there couldn't be a more important time to try and promote physical activity um, and sport to a whole community. Um, we're going through difficult times, very difficult times. We're in the absolutely heart of a pandemic. And there's a challenge, a really big challenge to face. So I want to go through today some of the science, um, how we've got to the state where so many people are inactive, but also the excitement of what we can do about it and how you, as, as part of RISE, can actually create a completely different uh, format for people to become more active. So let's go back to the beginning, the, the very beginning, 200,000 years. So that's when we were hunter-gatherers and we were very good at being a hunter-gatherer. Population expanded rapidly from South and East Africa all the way around the world within that time. So we must have done something very right as we got going. And if we take it and concertine it into 24 hours, then it's a little easier to see why perhaps things have gone a bit wrong more recently. So let's go back to 200,000 years. That's 24 hours ago. We were hunter-gatherers in groups of about 100, foraging for food, killing wild animals, perhaps fighting each other every now and then. And that continued for a very, very, very long time. And in fact, if we put it on our 24-hour clock, that goes all the way through to just 70 minutes ago. And 70 minutes ago, we settled down with agriculture. So we were still outdoors. We were still active. We were still very much in groups together but we weren't so nomadic. And then just 30 minutes ago, we became more rooted in civilizations. And that was when the first cities came in probably ancient Egypt at the moment, or perhaps in Iran, in those areas, where we were now more settled, but buildings were taking shape. That was just 30 minutes ago from a 24 hours ago. And then if we just go to a few minutes ago, well, in, let's say one minute ago, it's industrialization. That's the car, that's the factories. That's now where we're not only in civilizations, but we're now indoors doing lots of our work. We're no longer outdoors. But that wasn't the big change because you still had your family, your grandparents perhaps, and those you may remember in the 1950s and 60s who were still very active, still outdoors all the time as children. So what changed? Well, let's go to 16 seconds ago. So 16 seconds ago, we developed the computer and we became indoors. And the roaming of a child went from on average a few miles down to a few metres. So children now can't go out They're on their computer. Part of it's because there's so much on their computer and their screen, but also is because our lifestyles have changed and there's more fear. So we are now bottled in doors and that's where the big change of physical activity has gone down. And when you think about it, the change between us being indoors all the time in front of a screen compared to what we were designed to be as a hunter-gatherer is huge. And that's called the mismatch, where our bodies are no longer in an environment we were designed for. Our bodies are now in an environment which is alien and although we're very adaptable as humans, it means that we're now more stressed than we've ever been before. And that's because there's this mismatch between where we should be and where we are. So let's have a quick look then at where we could be and where, as a hunter-gatherer, we actually were designed to be. That's the people, place and purpose. So how should we be? How were we designed to be when we were hunter-gatherers? Well, we were connected together in small groups, probably about 100 people. Um, people we knew, people we really felt close to, people who supported us, the family, the friends. That's really important. We are social animals. The second thing, and we forget this, is we're connected to place. We're connected to nature. Our whole body, everything about our brain is geared to being connected to a natural environment. And that's when we are at our most content very often is when we're out in nature, particularly in children under the age of 14, where that, is, that relationship is developed. Um, but being outdoors where you don't, feel, um, you don't feel threatened, you feel there's no you know, the cars and everything else threaten us at the moment, you don't feel for crime, antisocial behaviour, that's all threatening behaviour. So to have none of that is 
how we were designed and that's when we feel less stressed and finally is to feel less purpose and if you want to look at the um, ways to well-being it's connecting it's taking notice and then it's being active giving and keep learning now if we just look at this sort of mismatch that's occurred the ideal environment how we were designed is that big green circle where we are now is now in that kind of blue circle and you can see the bit in that blue circle that's moved away from where the idea is the area of mismatch. So that's where we're not geared up to being connected to as we were designed to be. And this is where we are now. We've got fear and chronic stress because we're disconnected from people. We're a lot of loneliness, a lot of isolation, even within families, even within workplaces, even within the schools. The places where we are, as we've said, can be full of cars, it can be antisocial behaviour, there's a fear of crime, it can just be very nasty, and there's no nature. And we may not have any purpose, we don't know what our value is, we don't know if people care about us. And if you get all of that, then you get chronic stress and fear. And we know that if you are under chronic stress, you behave differently. And one of the things is that you cease to become active. You kind of, your body locks down and actually conserves energy because of that stress. So you're the opposite to being vibrant and energetic. So there's no point in going to someone to try and get them active if they're in that state of chronic stress. You have to deal with that chronic stress before we can really start to develop the activity in that person. Because that chronic stress and loneliness leads to the poor health behaviours like inactivity, poor diet, obesity, um, smoking, alcohol, all of those things are all a reaction to that chronic stress. So when you've got this chronic stress, which is a condition we're increasingly understanding, and we've seen a lot of it during lockdown, is it releases adrenaline and other things, which are the stress hormones, and it also um, changes our behaviour. And that creates something called chronic inflammation, where now the immune system joins in. The immune system is now geared up to try and fight anything that is likely to cause problems. So if you're under stress, it may be because there's going to be a famine, it may be because there's going to be a war, it's going to be something else that was happening as a hunter-gatherer, and therefore your immune system had to be in tip-top condition, almost over, in overdrive, to cope with any problems that were going to occur. But when there's no fighting to be done, there's no virus or there's no activity, the immune system starts to attack our own bodies and that's called chronic inflammation. We've heard a lot about it, um, particularly for COVID, where patients who've got chronic inflammation are more likely to get the problems later on in the disease. So what is the problem about chronic inflammation? Well, it is known to be the cause of causes of pretty much every condition. So if we look here, pretty much everything of cancers and heart disease and depression and dementia, um, arthritis, um, all of these things are all related to chronic inflammation and it starts at the age of six in some children. So you can see now that this chronic stress because of the problems that we have got people, purpose, places all wrong leads to inactivity, poor diet, smoking alcohol, poor sleep as well and then that creates this chronic stress which um, that creates this chronic inflammation. So what is it that we can do? Well, the first thing we can do is to become active. And walking is one of the first things that everyone can do. And even if we got everybody in the area of Northumberland and Tyneside to walk that bit more, we would have dealt with a huge amount of problems causing disease. So let's have a quick look at what happens when you become active. First of all, you reduce the visceral fat. Now, the visceral fat is the fat not in this bit on the outside, but the bit on the inside, the white parts there you can see on the inside. Now that visceral fat is highly dangerous. It's storage, temporary. That's how it was designed as a hunter-gatherer. That you craved carbohydrates and fat and you managed to get lots in and it all stayed within your body. And then that visceral fat was a storage. It wasn't there meant to be there for very long. It was just meant to be there for a short while. And the trouble is it creates lots of inflammation because the cells increase so big that they can't get enough oxygen into the middle of them. So they cause this inflammation, the immune system attacks it. So visceral fat, obesity around the tummy is highly dangerous. And when you walk, those orange bars are the 
reduction of visceral fat. So how brilliant it is that just by walking a bit more every day, you can get rid of one of the biggest causes of that inflammation, which has so many problems, and that's called the reduction of visceral fat. Um, and it's just exercise that does it. Of course, diet will do the same, but activity targets visceral fat. The next thing is every time you walk, and any exercise at all, you actually release myokines. And myokines are from muscles, they're anti-inflammatory, they go around the whole body, they bathe the, the brain, the heart, the vessels, calming down the immune system, making it much calmer. And that will last up to about 12 hours after a bout of exercise. Hence, you try to do exercise at least twice a day, not just your once a day, if you can. And finally, let's look at what a healthy cell should look like? Well, you've got your nucleus, you've got your mitochondria, which are the little mus the, the batteries of every cell. And if we look at a mitochondria, normally, if it's there turning over, um, it's got energy coming in, which is what you eat. It's got energy going out, which is your physical activity. Um, but there's some things can upset it. So if you're not exercising and you're eating too much and you're stressed, then that battery starts to overcharge and when it overcharges it releases electrons and those electrons are called free radicals so if you release those free radicals these are the red things coming out now you can start to see they attack the mitochondria itself they're highly dangerous they go out as well into the outside of the mitochondria into the rest of the cell and those free radicals are really what we don't want that's why you hear about the sort of anti-inflammatory diets and antioxidants to try and cope with those so that is someone who's sedentary, who's stressed, and who's eating too much. Turn that around and become active and have a, a low calorie diet and not be so stressed, which is what we're meant to be. And suddenly you find that the mitochondria purrs away now, really happy. It builds up more antioxidants, no more free radicals, and you actually make more mitochondria in that cell. So the cell lasts longer, doesn't age so quickly, and continues very, very efficiently. Those free radicals, I said, come out of the mitochondria. And the bad thing is they go to the very heart of your body, which is the nuclear. And in a nucleus, you've got the chromosomes. And in the chromosomes, at the end of the chromosomes, you've got telomeres. And telomeres, the shorter they are, the less likely you're going to have a long life. The longer they are, the more likely you're going to have a long life. So the length of a telomere appears to be very connected to how long we live and the diseases we get. And those telomeres, they shorten every time the cell divides until they get so short that cell can no longer divide, which is when that cell disappears and that's ageing. When those free radicals come out, they seem to target the telomeres and artificially shorten it. So even people in their 18 to 20 who've had a really bad childhood will find that they've got shorter telomeres as a start, making it very hard for them to catch up later on. If you've been a child having a difficult time, perhaps you've been not eating so well as you could have done or haven't been exercising or have had a very stressful time of the ad adverse childhood events, then you're more likely to have created lots of free radicals, more likely therefore to have got shorter telomeres before you've even really got going in life. So these telomeres being shortened are really important, really, really important for how our well-being and our health is going to be for the rest of our lives. And the amazing thing is that when you are physically active, you create an enzyme called telomerase that lengthens those telomeres. So you can imagine now that you've got something here that you can do to actually make you live longer. The only thing we really know that reverses aging properly. So that telomerase, when it's released, causes the telomeres to lengthen. And then if you stop those free radicals from attacking the telomeres by becoming more active, eating a bit better, then you find that you're, you can catch back up again. So it's all good news in that physical activity, probably the most important thing you can do to help you prevent the aging, along with obviously the diet as well. So this chronic inflammation is a scourge. It's a real problem. And it's something we're increasingly understanding. You can buy books on anti-inflammatory diets. You can buy books about how inflammation is causing anxiety and depression. There are books all over the place about chronic inflammation now. So if we just summarise, if we get things right at the beginning, higher up, 
get people working together, get, make sure the places that people come to are welcoming and nice and clean and they're not threatening. Make sure people don't feel left out, they feel valued. And then, then you've got the beginnings of being able to change people's behaviour because then you can start to talk about physical activity. But until you understand where people are, we're never going to be able to change physical activity levels because an inactive town is actually a dying town. It's a town which can't f keep people connected together. Places become more vulnerable for antisocial behaviour and you get a whole lot of people who don't feel they've got value and therefore don't want to volunteer. So it is so important to have that physical activity to keep people connected to each other, to keep people connected to that environment and get people to learn and understand. And, and if we get that right, then we won't have this problem of the chronic um, stress, poor health behaviours, all the damage and all the diseases. Instead, um, we will get actual happiness, being active, energy, vibrancy, um, where people are together, where the places are nice, where people have that purpose. You get increased confidence, greater concentration. We get less illness, contentment, better behaviour. All of those are evidence-based about when you start to get people more active. And then in society, you get increased productivity at workplace by a considerable amount, safer streets, better air quality, stronger students as well from school, community cohesion, independence of people as they become older, and more volunteering. So it's an incredible change that you can make to a society simply by changing the norm, shifting that culture. So let's have a look and see how this works in real life. So Bob is someone we need to get active. He's someone who's about in his early 50s. He actually lives in um, an area of Liverpool. It's a fairly poor area, so not very pleasant to walk around. He lives on the 14th floor of the tower block. And we've got to get him active. And I'm a doctor. So as a GP, I've just got to say, look, why don't you just get active, Bob? Why don't you get off the bus to stop earlier? Well, why should Bob do that? Why should he walk that horrible 400 yards in the wet with his shopping, with his leg ulcers he's got because he's got diabetes and he's depressed as well. And he's lost his job. So why should he when the bus stop is right outside his flat, why should he make that misery of that time where there's traffic and it's not a particularly nice area? Because I haven't thought about what his life is like. I've just said what glibly I would feel in a nice area where you can walk and just be very happy walking along the last bit of the road, thinking your thoughts. But for Bob, it's very different. Why don't you take the stairs, Bob? Well, I do. I take the stairs. I leap up the stairs. It's always great going up the stairs. You feel so much better at the end. But Bob's got leg ulcers. He's got his shopping. He's feeling miserable. He just wants to get home. He's feeling exhausted. He's feeling tired all the time. He's feeling depressed. Why would you want to go up 14 flights of stairs? OK, Bob, why don't you go up to 10 flights and then take the last four? Oh, come on. Why would you want to do that? How miserable are we making Bob's life all for the sake of this kind of bitter pill of physical activity? Why don't you take an exercise lesson, Bob? Betty's got a brilliant class down below in that community centre. So he goes along to that first community class and he feels utterly hopeless. He can't even get his leg off the ground. It's too heavy for him to do that. It's hurting too much. And he feels miserable and put out. Even though everyone was very welcoming, he just felt this is not for me. But luckily, he went to the pub and he met someone who said, look, at Anfield, Liverpool, the community um, section of it is actually putting on walks for people to get to Liverpool, to get to Anfield. And if you go along on one of these walks, you can stop off at the old pub we used to go to and then you can get in half price because it's getting expensive now. So Bob does that. He gets picked up and he walks along, has a drink at the pub with all his friends he remembers from before because he used to be at Anfield all the time but couldn't afford it and hasn't been for many, many years. And when he gets to Anfield, but guess what? He's walked two miles. He's walked two miles, not because we told him to become more active and get off a bus to stop early and all that nonsense, because we actually gave him purpose again. And he was with his friends. And the place where he was was meant something to him. 
and going to Anfield is everything. So suddenly we've made that walking two miles, not exercise, not health, not 150 minutes, not all that nonsense at all, but we've actually made it an experience for Bob. <clears throat> that physical activity is now hidden behind that greater experience. It was invisible to him, the walking bit, the bit he remembers as the trip. And it's a means to an end, not the end in itself. So we're not talking about you've got to do your two miles, we're talking about you've got to get to Anfield. That's the end for him. And then that's what we have to do. We have to find what actually makes people happier, gives them that purpose back, gives them that feeling of being wanted and needed and, and, and cared for, and physical activity is wrapped up in that whole experience. So we've moved away from just more tennis courts and more leisure centres, which are all important. We still have physical activity in sport, and that must remain. It's a cornerstone of very many communities to keep some of the sport going. But we've now moved to much more of a community where people are doing Zumba classes in the park and they're doing health walks and they're doing park runs and they're doing things in the community. That's what we talk about is social prescribing now. And then, but we've moved on and we have to move on to another phase. And that phase is where everybody takes control. Everyone becomes a leader. Everyone is now part of a social movement. And that social movement, like the person who got Bob to move two miles on walking, that social movement is the crux to how we're going to change physical activity levels and get a whole society, reset the norm. And we have to do it in a disruptive way sometimes. We have to do it collaboratively. Um, and we have to show leadership. And we've just done that in Intelligent Health, where I work, by changing a whole town into a game, and that's the beat the street. And where we put little beatboxes everywhere, and suddenly you get people exploring new areas which they've never been to before. They go to the parks, they go to um, the canals, they go down the rivers, they meet people they've not met before, they go and try new sports. This is all about showing people that it's all there already. We don't have to create lots of new things, but everything's in place, it just needs to be activated. So let's have a quick recap then of some of this science. If we get things right, people connected, places which are good, purpose, and there's also the genes which we're lucky, then you will find that stressful events cannot get down and reach us and affect us too much. But if we get it wrong, then, and that resilience is not very strong, then that goes to chronic stress. And that chronic stress leads to addictions of alcohol and smoking and inactivity and poor diet and poor sleep. And inactivity, therefore, cannot be treated on its own. It has to be treated in the context of getting at resilience. And then we can see the effects right across the body of every other aspect. And actually, strangely enough, for poor diet and obesity, inactivity, alcohol problems, all cause pretty much similar things are right across the body, some of them all targeted to some areas, but we're dealing with an immune system of chronic inflammation. So, how does all effect rise? Well, the first thing you want to do is be a catalyst for change. And that's absolutely where one should start. We have to change things. We can't expect to do the same as we've been doing because we'll get the same results and they have not been good. Right across the country, right across the Western world. So it has to be radical change. But the good thing is that everything's out there. You've already got people who are willing to be volunteers. You've already got places which are nice to walk in and be, be in. You've already got sort of clubs and other things all there waiting to have more people. There's lots of things already there, but it just needs to be activated. And the next thing then is that it has to be a disruption. So when we talk about physical activity, there are some people who feel that physical activity is their patch and they're the people who should be delivering physical activity. Actually, everyone should be delivering physical activity. We shouldn't be holding things tight. We should be letting go, allowing people, allowing others to take on this whole mantle. It is so important to get a society active, as I've seen. It's not just the health. It's the whole infrastructure of a society of volunteering, of well-being, of work, of education, of employment. All of those things depend on an active society. So there has to be disruption. There has to be ways of perhaps pushing things which offer resistance. 
And actually, the more resistance you find, probably the better the change is going to be. And then finally, it's got to be done collaboratively. Absolutely. There is nobody who now owns physical activity. Physical activity is owned by not just the whole council in every department, but actually every single individual, every mum taking a child to school, every child taking their parents on a walk, every teacher, every GP, every receptionist, every shopkeeper, everyone should be taking responsibility of that social movement where we get people active and that means that delegation democratization of physical activity is a key thing so really exciting you've got obviously a huge amount to look forward to and a massive challenge which we've got not just in this country but everywhere else to actually be able to make a change but with the right thinking with the energy we can actually have a nation uh, an area now of Tyneside and Northumberland that will have that energy, improve that well-being, and give that purpose. And that's what physical activity can do, and an amazing reward to getting it right. Thank you.